Good evening and good morning, everyone. Huanying Da Jia. I'm Dinda Elliott, Director of Programs at China Institute, and we are thrilled to be hosting this conversation about the beauty and hidden meaning behind the architecture of the Forbidden City. This is the first of a three part series that we're presenting about the Forbidden City to commemorate its 600th birthday. Tonight's program is in partnership with the American Institute of Architects Center for Architecture as part of their October festival of events all around New York City. And we are so very honored to be working with the Palace Museum on this series of programs. We have three truly world-class scholars joining, joining us this evening to talk about the Forbidden City. No wonder we have almost 900 people signed up for tonight's program. We're delighted to welcome curators, academics, museum directors, and friends from all over the world tonight. So it's my pleasure now to introduce James Heimowitz, president of China Institute, who will introduce tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dinda, and welcome everybody for what promises to be a really special evening or morning where you are. Um, I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute. And one thing that struck me, the China Institute's been here since 1926, helping Americans have a better insight and a more nuanced and appreciation for Chinese, for China through culture, through language, and through education. And one thing that struck me above all is, you know, we have a shared history. And at China Institute, we're helping to give people the tools to understand how we can also have a, a shared future. Um, Tonight's program is also super personal for me. I've been going to China for almost four, well, 45 years. And for the first time when I went and set foot in Beijing in the late 1970s, the first place I went was to the Forbidden City. And frankly, it was not a pretty sight. I mean, you could imagine what its glory was, but um, it had come into disrepair. It was the time of the Cultural Revolution and 600 years of history was sort of in tatters. And thanks so much to the hard work um, that people at the Palace Museum have been undertaking and the restoration projects that have been in place, we can bring to life and let people see the glory and the history of this amazing structure. Um, at the same time, when I'm talking about personal, we also have Professor Nancy Steinhardt here and everything that I started to learn and understand about Chinese art history and Chinese art uh, came from my learning um, at the University of Pennsylvania as a teenager. And I'm delighted, just delighted to welcome her here. Um, she's also a long-term uh, standing member of our gallery committee, which helps and advise our gallery committee. Anyway, you didn't come here to listen to me. You joined so that you could listen to the amazing speakers that we've assembled tonight. First person that's up, and it's truly an honor and a delight, is to welcome Director Rin Wanping, She's the deputy director of the Palace Museum and actually doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. She is one of the leading scholars of Ming and Qing um, archival research, craftsmanship, and history overall. And she's under her leadership. The Beijing Palace Museum has done just extraordinary things, and we're in for a, a real treat. So, Ren Zhuan, Huanying, over to you. 大家好, 今天很高兴和大家一起交流中华文化尤其是我们在一起交流故宫这样的一个话题我们故宫啊从一四二零年建成到今年呢已经有六百年的历史在这里呢它是明清两朝的皇宫一共有二十四位皇帝在这里呢
呃，故宫呢也叫紫禁城啊，它直接继承了。唐宋时代的皇宫的规制与我们的城市功能、山水形式呢有机的结合，是我们中国古代城市建设和宫殿建造的思想上的最集中的体现。So, in terms of the design of the Forbidden City, and now turning to Palace Museum, it actually continued the traditions from the in terms of construction, in terms of the format and formula, and the、uh, the rules. Uh, from the Tang and Song Dynasty, and this is a perfect and orga organic combination and integration of the palace with the urban planning, urban functions, as well as the the landscape surrounding the palace, including the mountains and the waters and the、uh, rivers that are around the cities. So, in a way, it is an epitome of what it means to have.、Uh, This long tradition of ancient urban planning and construction, as well as palatial constructions, and、um, continue. 在六百年的传承中啊，我们讲天人之际，礼乐复合的中国思想，这种文化思想一以贯之的发扬光大，并且呢，也体现出强烈的民族融合，也有东学西渐的这种文化特质，是有容乃大的中国文化胸怀的实物例证。也是中华民族当之无愧的大成之城。So in a way that this 600 years of tradition being manifested or actualized in this particular design, it's really to think about the the connections uh, uh, between the heaven and the humanity. It's also the perfect integrations of the rites and the music. How these thoughts continuously throughout.、Uh, Generations and centuries、uh, continue this particular、uh, thought in terms of the the cultural traditions, but at the same time also make it even more glorious through the design and through the construction of this particular location. Now, for the city also、uh, represent a very strong integration of different ethnicities and nationality within the China within the China、uh, Chinese uh, territory. But at the same time, also take on the cultural characteristic、uh, characteristics and also the influence from the West. So it's definitely a perfect example of this concept of achieving greatness through inclusion, and it's definitely one of the perfect example of how you can. It's a city of great attainment. 天上紫微园，地上紫禁城，天子向天立功。所以呢，紫禁城被誉为地上的天宫。So in a way, you can think about in in、uh, in the sky,、uh, in terms of the Chinese constellations, you have something called the purple forbidden enclosure, and that very much been evoked、uh, or somehow、uh, mirrored with the design of the forbidden city here、uh, on Earth. So, in a way, is that in the past you have these emperors that they somehow emulate the, the、uh, constellations as a way to design the palace that they live and they rule in, and therefore, there's no wonder that、uh, Forbidden City has been、uh, called it is、uh, this celestial palace on Earth. 呃，这样的宫殿建筑呢，就是我们中国古代建筑史上最辉煌的篇章。它历来都是中国古代营造的重点的所在，是历代帝王呢借此来突出皇权的至高无上，呃，由此呢来呃设福天下。Mm -hmm. So in a way, the、uh, palatial architectural is the most glorious chapters in the history of the China's ancient architecture. And throughout time, has been the emphasis for ancient Chinese construction, and therefore the the Forbidden City is more than other examples a comprehensive expressions of the development of the palatial architecture, as it represents the periods of highest level architectural arts and technology, and has become the symbol of、uh, of state power and also the way to show the dignity. The dignity and the power, supreme power of the 
the state and the the uh, the empire. 呃，紫禁城呢，它更是宫殿建筑的发展的集大成者，它代表了当时的建筑的技术和艺术的最高的水准。巍峨壮丽的宫殿建筑群，它不仅满足了古代帝王的物质和文化需求，而且呢，也成为皇权神圣的象征。And as I just mentioned before, that this is in a way the collections of the highest level of craftsmanship, design, and thought, and also a symbol of the power, the supreme power of these dynasties and the people rule in. 呃，六百年的紫禁城呢，呃，至今呢，呃，经过了很多次的修缮。那么我们近期的修缮呢，就首先是呃，新世纪以来两千零二年的一次武英殿大修的试点工程的这种开工，它标志着我们故宫呢，从这个帝王政权被推翻以后啊，这一次最大规模的，也是历史最久的，也是修缮最多的这种保护工程的这种拉开了序幕。也被称为世纪大修。So in the past 600 years,、uh, recently we have、uh, gone through many restorations and renovations of the palace, and one of which started in 2002, which is the restorations of the、uh, the Hall of Marshal Valier, and this particular hall、uh, program,、uh, the restoration of the program. In 2002, as I mentioned, and it symbolized the the largest scales and also the longest time the duration in terms of restoration and also the items and the projects that we do also is the the most extensive and compress comprehensive one since the em、uh, the empire was、uh, abdicated.、Uh, so definitely it is.、Uh, A very large scale reno renovation, and we even call it as the, the the renovation of the century. 呃，这次大修啊，它不仅是对我们的遗产本体进行整体的保护，也是对我们的保护保护方法、理论和技术的全面实践和深度的思考。So in terms of this particular renovation, not only it is about preservation and protection of all the Cultural relics, but also it's about the methods, the technology, the theories,、uh, how we can preserve in、uh, these cultural legacies and cultural relics to have a very、uh, deep understanding, exploration, and research on、uh, the the practice and also the ways that we can continue this particular、uh, renovation project. We from traditional Qing method of preservation. 到现代保护技术的应用，以及从高质量材料的遴选，到官式营造技艺的传承，完整真实的保护了文化遗产的同时呢，也管理机制呢也在变革，人才队伍呢也极大的就推动了这样遗产保护事业的发展。So not only we are continuing the traditions and also the ancient techniques to preserve and to protect. The cultural relics, but at the same time, we're integrating the modern technologies in terms of、uh, the the most up to date, most cutting edge、uh, preservation technologies and techniques. We also choose the highest quality of materials、uh, in order for us to conduct our renovations. We also,、uh, in the, addition to all this, we are also thinking about how we going to officially cultivate enough craftsmanship. I'm sorry, the craftsmen and also artisan, in order for them to somehow continue and pass on this tradition to the next generation.、Uh, in addition to that, we also trying to be、uh, trying to comprehensively and、uh, very truthfully protect all the、uh, the cultural documents and records and、uh, uh, and all the elements of the the palace. But at the same time, thinking about how we can revolutionize and reform the ma the management me mechanism, so that we can manage the palace museum in a more efficient manner, and somehow in the meantime cultivate enough、uh, people、uh, to be able to join our efforts to participate in this particular、uh, 
efforts and this particular endeavors to preserve and to protect these cultural uh, heritage. Uh, 重点的这个修缮工程就是养心殿研究性保护这样修缮项目 so most recently, we had another renovation project that we are doing, and this is two years ago. Uh, it broke ground in 2018, which is the renovation for the, the Hall of Mental Cultivation within the Forbidden City, within the Palace Museum. So what we do in the past two years is not only to document in detail all the cultural relics that we have, and also for the mobile or removable pieces, we will then somehow uh, take them out of the uh, their, their original location for future exhibition. And in the meantime, we're trying to not only restore the uh, cultural relics, we also uh, focus a lot on the pest control to make sure that these cultural relics will not be uh, damaged by the pests uh, in the environment. We also start doing the survey projects uh, to take a look at these uh, ancient architecture. In the meantime, selecting and cultivating craftsmen or craftswomen that can actually uh, continue the, the efforts of preservation and pass down that techniques and that skills from generation to generation. So in this particular uh, juncture, uh, the, the whole of mental cultivation is in the process of major uh, reservation, uh, restorations and then reconstructions, and we are in the midst of it. Uh, 要在修缮过程中呢，进行古建筑传统修缮技艺的传承，这三大原则要必须这个完整的坚持。So mm -hmm. to us, this particular renovation, we have three major principles that we are adhering to. Uh, number one is to make sure that we would do our best to do the maximum ability to preserve the historical information and the details from this this ancient architecture. And the second principle is not to change any type of the, uh, the appearance of this ancient architecture. And the last one is to uh, really focus on the, the, uh, the passing down the traditions, passing down the skills, passing in the craftsmanship from generation to generation through some type of trainings and uh, cultivation. And those are the three principles. 正是经过这样的不断的修缮，我们六百年的故宫呢，依然巍峨屹立在这里，并且呢，我们还要把这壮美的紫禁城完整的交给子孙后代，啊，交给下一个六百年。So because of these renovations throughout uh, different times and different uh, in the recent past histories, I think that's the uh, that that's the reason why. Uh, the Palace Museum or the Forbidden City can still stand uh, now 60 years after, I'm sorry, 600 years after. And I think that this is also the reason why we need to start thinking about how can we make sure we preserve this Forbidden City in its entirety comprehensively so that we can pass down to the next generation so that they can have another 600 years ahead. 为了纪念故宫六百年，我们举办了一系列的活动。在展览方面呢，我们有直切六百年主题的单城永固紫禁城建成六百年展。So to commemorate the six hundred years of Palace Museum or Forbidden City, we have organized a series of activities and events. Uh, in terms of the exhibition, we have this direct. A connection with this particular thing with the exhibition called by the name of 
everlasting splendor, 600 years at Forbidden City. 呃，我们举办了多场的这个视频直播活动，其中有央视频的连续八个小时的直播，还发布了各种的纪念品，包括纪念邮票、纪念金银币以及纪念券等。And we created many programs that can be live streamed to the audience, and we also create a lot of different cultural, uh, innovative cultural products such as uh, stamps, coins, to commemorate these 600 years of Forbidden City. Uh, we opened the Forbidden City Lecture Hall, Zhijin Cheng. 六百呃，建成六百年，中国明清史国际论坛，以及召开了呃，我们紫禁城建成六百年，呃，与故宫博物院成立九十五周年的座谈会，各级领导学者都鼓励故宫要不断的推进各项事业，再上层楼，再创辉煌。谢谢。And in terms of scholarship. We actually organize quite a few uh, forums and also panels. And the forums will be, to, uh, for example, uh, to commemorate the 600 years of Forbidden City, we have the international uh, forums uh, discussing, uh, discussing and also talking about the, the, uh, the Ming and Qing dynasty and the China within that particular historic context. We also, with the support of government officials, a lot of uh, institutions, educational institutions, and uh, a lot of research institutions, and many, many uh, experts and scholars to participate in the panels that we put together, not only to commemorate the 600, year, 600 years of Forbidden City, but also for the establish, establishment of Palace Museum. Uh, this is the 95th. Uh, and there's an anniversary of the establishment of Palace Museum. So because of all of these projects and activities that we, we were encouraged uh, by many to continue what we've been doing and our efforts to make sure that we will have even more glorious and greater years ahead for Palace Museum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 任主任非常感谢，而且特别感谢你北京时间这么早出来给我们介绍，呃，故宫的活动。Thank you so much for being here. 中华文化，我们很高兴。We're so thrilled to have you. Thank you so much. Um, and we hope to visit you sometime soon in Beijing. So, um, I want to say that it's now my real honor to turn the program over to Professor Nancy Steinhardt from the University of of Pennsylvania, who is one of the world's top experts on Chinese architecture with a new book on the subject. Um, so Nancy is also a longtime dear friend of China Institute and an important member <coughs> of our gallery committee. Nancy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is my great honor to introduce Professor Liao Chang of Tsinghua University. A little more than 10 months ago, he and I were sitting across each other uh, at a table at one of his favorite restaurants in Beijing talking about Chinese architecture. I know that everyone listening tonight hopes for a return to life as it was. And therefore, Liao Chang, it is extremely meaningful to me that because of China Institute, we're able to continue this conversation face to face tonight. I could spend the next hour talking about Liu Chang's accomplishments, but I will be very brief because I know we want to hear him. Uh, Professor Liu received his BA from Tsinghua University's architecture department in 1992. Upon graduation, he had the opportunity to work as an architectural conservator at the Palace Museum, which he did until 1998. At that point, he returned to Tsinghua and because of his outstanding preparation, was able to complete both his MA and his PhD in just four years. While working on his PhD, he taught at the uh, prestigious National University Renmin and upon completion of the degree in 2002, he began teaching and supervising a research group at Tsinghua, where he is today. Between 2012 and 2014, 
Professor Liu visited Colombia, where he taught courses on Chinese architecture. In 2016, he came back to the United States to participate in a, in a conservation project at Winterthur. Liu Chang has written or co-authored 12 books and more than 90 scholarly articles. That's my most recent count. Perhaps there are more. He gives lectures all over the world, but that's only about half of what he does. He's also an architect and conservator. He's been central to the identification and reconstruction of the Qianlong Gardens in the Forbidden City, and China Institute will host a program on that topic in about five weeks. Uh, he's done preservation and reconstruction at the Zhengguo Monastery in Shanxi, which includes a 10th century building, and he's been part of a study group of the famous Foguang Monastery on Wutai. In other words, Liu Chang works on China's most, most important buildings. One of his teachers gave me a copy of a book that he wrote on the Forbidden City in 2014. You will see some of his graphics, some of his extraordinary graphic ability in the PowerPoint tonight. And actually, Liu Chang, just yesterday, I was using your book on Fujian, on the architectural mapping of the oh, really? province of Fujian, yes. So uh, let me now turn the program over to you to talk about the Forbidden City as it turns 600. Thank you, Emma there. My turn, right? Hello. Hello, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Nancy, for trans introducing me. I make me feel a bit naked. But, but anyway, um, Today I'll stick to my uh, time guideline and, and give a short speak in 15 minutes about the Forbidden City. Um, uh, sorry, before, because I haven't used my English for almost one year, so allow me to speak slowly. Uh, and today I thought the topic over and made the bold decision that before Nancy pilots us into uh, the, the boot, boot, bird looking of the Forbidden City and a cross border of culture, uh, I would like to uh, uh, focus on uh, some of the big names in the construction and behind the scene uh, uh, who we may know not of before. Uh, so could you please turn on the PowerPoint and take place of my uh, old time furrowed face, uh, Aaron? Well, thank you so much. Okay, uh, here, uh, um, this is a topic uh, I would like to mention uh, four pairs of names. One is the Ming and Qing architect, the other name would be the emperor, uh, during which time uh, the architect worked. So next, please. Yes, the first pair. The first pair, uh, the first name in the first pair, pair, pair is Cai Xin. Uh, who worked for Emperor Yongle, whose name is Zhu Di, uh, when the emperor decided to build a forbidden city. And next, the most famous sentence in historical archive, uh, they shared the time of uh, Brunelleschi, Philip Brunelleschi in the early Renaissance. And next, uh, the most famous sentence in the archive is that all the master crafts from uh, the entire states came to serve the emperor should follow Cai Xin's ink marks, which deem his uh, a high position in the entire work of uh, the construction of the original building of the city. And uh, next, please. And nowadays we can say maybe the master plan, the layout of the Ferguson buildings uh, is just using his ruler and his ink mark, but if we name a single structure that may have been designed by him, I, I would rather mention this building, uh, the Shewoman, the North Gate of the Forbidden City. Next, please. Uh, yes, this is a building location in the master plan. And this is structure, the timber structure exposed. Uh, we see all the tilings uh, take off. And next, please. Yes, and I have four sentences to say about this building. The first, this structure coincidentally 
shares the same construction ruler that lay the forbidden city out. I mean, the forbidden city is laid out based on a certain ruler. The length of the ruler is rigid, and the structure. After our measurement, we found out they use the same ruler. Sentence number one. Sentence number two. Next page, please. Arrow. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, interesting uh, details, like dogon brackets, uh, like the uh, the uh, the the slow bridge beams at two ends, at two sides, on top level. Is uh, is at angle. It's not uh, uh, horizontal. It's at angle. This kind of details uh, is quite early period style, like like before uh, 14th century style. Uh, Sentence number three. Next page, please. Sorry, not yet. Yeah, this one. Uh, uh, we miss one. Uh, the uh, structure has some kind of uh, proportion, uh, uh, which is also coincidence with the early style. Uh, and the, the next page is the hidden structure. We found a lot of hundreds of details that makes us. Uh, say this structure is so carefully made that as if they were making a piece of furniture. And even in the hidden places, uh, the left hand side picture, we have a, a, a joint of what we call rafters, uh, small beams joined together at a turning angle in the roof. It, this part will be covered uh, and, and, and actually was covered under the sheets board uh, and the wood board uh, for uh, laying the tiles. And at the very end of the joint of the rafter, the, 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 the craftsman made a joint of one whole piece of wood instead of a, a two. Uh, see the circle on our right hand side. Generally, there should be two components joining together, but here the turning, the, the size of the timber is so small that the uh, craftsman inclined to use only one piece, a carved piece. So you carve at where, at a place hidden, just like you swallow in some, uh, like a swallow a diamond into stomach to, to, to embellish your stomach. So it's a ridiculous, uh, de, uh, uh, elaborate, uh, way of carving used here. So I would say, uh, even though we do not know the signature, the style of Cai Xin, but we can tell that he has a uh, lot of uh, uh, in interesting ideas and uh, he's very keen about the quality of all the detailed draw drawings. And then the next pair is uh, Liang Jiu and Xuan Ye. Uh, Xuan Ye is Emperor Kangxi, right? And Liang Jiu is reported in the Imperial Edicts uh, that saying that uh, Liang Jiu uh, contributed uh, greatly to the construction of the supreme harmony. So Liang Jiu's work uh, is a supreme harmony, and they share the time of uh, uh, Christopher Wren uh, uh, in the 17th century. And the supreme harmony, next page, please. Well, it's, it's not the original structure that built in 1420, but rather in the year of uh, 1695. And next, uh, uh, and next. So uh, this is a plan of the forbidden, uh, of the uh, Supreme Harmony. And uh, we made careful measurements, uh, measures, and also we found a, a, an archive telling us all the detail of the measurements, of the base, of the heights, of a lot of detailed measurements. And we can tell that, next page please, that a lot of the dimensions of the Forbidden City is of very odd number. Like the bay, of the span of two columns in, in, in the middle of the structure is like 26.35 feet. 
and the high, entire height of the structure is, of course, another uh, odd number. But if we, you calculate, uh, next page, please, the details of Dogun practice uh, and the trials, uh, all the details uh, come back to uh, the original measurement, original list of ruler, you can calculate, next page, you can find out that the middle bay of the structure is equal to the height of the column, including the Dogun brackets, which means Liangjiu was facing the main structure ruins with all the planes, all, all the column base ready there. He did not want to change the column base. Uh, so they measured the side carefully and use a perfect square, the middle bay. Next page. So in general, we can say along the almost eight kilometer central axis of the city of Beijing, we have a square in the location of the Supreme Harmony. So this story about Liangjiu, and I'm going to talk about the third person. Next page, please. Uh, well, skip. Yeah. The third name uh, is very new to a lot of uh, uh, audience, even uh, to the scholars. Uh, he, the gentleman whose name is Zhang Xisheng, served Emperor Qianlong. And we have Qianlong's image, but I, I do not have Zhang Xisheng's image. And Zhang Xisheng's name was remembered and recommended by Emperor Qianlong to the ministers after a big fire in the Forbidden City that burned down uh, a building uh, next to the Supreme Harmony. Next page. Uh, they shared time of uh, Piranesi and, and that building is Qi Renge, located on the left-hand side in front of the Supreme Harmony in the main courtyard. And next. And that fire took place in 1783 uh, in summer, but Qianlong wanted to come back for ceremony uh, in autumn. So he was facing a very urgent task and he was reminded of a carpenter's name, Zhang Xisheng. And it was Qianlong who told his disciple, uh, told his uh, ministers that you should find that craftsman and ask him to build structure. Let's see what structure looks like. And this, no, 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 the, the previous, yes, this one. Um, our, our, sorry, our left hand side is Ti Renge, is Zhang Xisheng's work. And on our right hand side is the opposite building that was constructed in Ming Dynasty. And Zhang Xisheng was facing the problems of a lack of a strong timber and was facing a, a, a lot of challenges and finding the proper proportion for the structure. So you can see he used a lot of, uh, a lot more beams and more columns to make the structure sound. And next, and he followed the instruction uh, of uh, maybe uh, where he, uh, he got his craftsmanship from, the way of proportioning the facade, the three huge circles. And he has his fingerprints there. Next page, please. And because of the time, he could not apply all the careful uh, uh, planning efforts, um, make the uh, old timber components smooth. He, you can see the round sec cross section purling on top. Uh, a lot of tool marks left there. And the tool mark is left by the as. Next page, please. Next page, please. Yes, as. Uh, no, no, no. Backward. Yeah. You know, using as to to make a purling is requires 
top skew. And you can see previous image, please. Uh, Zhang Xisheng asked his man, his workman, to make the purlins out of this tool. And uh, instead of uh, uh, using um, uh, the planes to smooth the surface because of the time deadline. And so this story about Zhang Xisheng, now I have the last name to mention, which is uh, Lei Siqi. And could you please turn the page downward a little bit? Yes, just the image. And Lei Siqi, oh, this image is not him, it's made by Lei Siqi, it's, not, it's uh, Lei Siqi's father. And on our, our right-hand side is the image of uh, uh, Empress Dowager Cixi, and Xin Zhen actually was her family name. And, and no, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's given name. And they share the time of, uh, yes, Gabriel, uh, who designed the Lubial Abaki. And, well, Lei Sichi's work is very interesting. It's so Michael Graves. Do you see that? It's just like Michael Graves' design. But this design uh, is for a theater stage in the courtyard of Yang Xindian, of the emperor's and bedroom and living room. And the time was so interesting. In 1974, just a year before Tongzhi Emperor died. And the function of this theater was to build a courtyard stage to perform in front of the window of the living room of Tongzhi. Tongzhi then was very sick a smallpox, almost dying, and uh, uh, some kind of a final uh, recover. And her, his mother, uh, Empress Dowager, uh, cared him so much and was thinking, well, maybe you should take time before time takes you. And uh, so, so we need some kind of in entertainment. We may need the uh, a, a play, a drama, a performance to make you happy and recover. So she decided to build this structure in the courtyard of Yang Xindian, a very uh, ceremonial place uh, to build this kind of theater stage. And if you observe the stage from other angle, next page, please, Sarah. Yes, you can see the color is like that. And inside the structure is a stage. You can have a performance on the stage play for the end. Uh, Okay, today I gave a uh, full architect's name, and we may have more. In ancient Greek time, the architect's name recorded uh, is sum up to uh, 400, uh, 100. And in, in the entire history of China, the recorded uh, big craftsman's name is only around 400. Uh, building industry uh, and gardeners uh, together. And in, for Qing Dynasty, we may only have uh, like 20 or so. So there's still a lot of work to, for us to do, to dig into the history, to find the craftsmen, and not only craftsmen, but the architect and their works and build connection and tell more stories about the persons and the buildings of Forbidden City. And thank you so much for your listening. Thank you. Fini. Oh, so Fini. Hi, that's there. <laughs> okay, so now I hope everybody can hear me and can see me. And I have a few things that I will say, and then uh, I will bring uh, Professor Leo Chang into the conversation at certain points. So I want to make a few remarks about the Forbidden City as someone who's walked the grounds perhaps 20 times, maybe I've walked the grounds 30 times, but someone who teaches this material in all variety of classes, does research on Chinese architecture, but nevertheless, who relies on your work and work of your group uh, so that I can do what I do. 
So how does an architectural historian professor outside of China perceive the Forbidden City? And how do I convey this monument in teaching and in writing? Since I teach at Penn, I begin by quoting my late colleague, Ed Bacon, the global urban historian who wrote in The Design of Cities that the Forbidden City is the greatest architectural achievement on earth. I tell students that only someone who had seen as many cities as he had seen could really make a comment like that, but perhaps we should call the Forbidden City the pinnacle of Chinese architecture, the superlative resolution toward which Chinese imperial planning had headed for several millennia before Kublai Khan came on the scene. And somehow in many classes, because of my interest in the Yuan dynasty, Kublai shows up and the city that he built shows up and those of you who know Beijing and know Beijing today recognize this as the so-called Lake District. And everyone on the screen probably knows Beijing as a vertical rectangle and a horizontal rectangle underneath it. And this is Kublai City, the rectangle. And this is a smaller city built by his predecessor who used Beijing for their capital, non-Chinese dynasty called Jin. And this is the yet smaller city used by the predecessors of the Jin, the Liao dynasty. Kublai is the one for whom an advisor, a Chinese advisor, turned to a classical text that describes the ideal city of a ruler and said that the palaces should be in the center and the forbidden city or the city where the ruler lives should be around it. So Kublai's city and the city that was around it. Someone who teaches outside of China always somehow comes to Marco Polo. Marco Polo probably doesn't need a label, but this is one of the many pictures that you see of Marco Polo, but he's just one of the foreigners who was in the Forbidden City at the time of Kublai and who wrote descriptions that would impact everyone in the West or outside of China who came after him. There was a group of missionaries, people sent from the Pope, John of Marignoli, John of Monte Corvino, two of them. There were people who described uh, the Forbidden City who may or may not have ever set foot there. One was Ibn Battuta who came from North Africa, probably made it to China, but maybe he didn't make it uh, as far north as today's Beijing, and perhaps the most suspect, John of Mandeville. But for the year 1420, I come here. So Yong Lo, you've already seen him. And this is a statue in Iran of a man named Giyat al-Din Nakash, who was in the Forbidden City in the year 1420, exactly 600 years ago. And he came as an emissary of Shah Rukh, uh, the Timurid ruler who wanted to have an alliance with China, and uh, he was there for just under a year. You can read the description on the screen. Uh, I, I took a piece of his uh, uh, description and I put it here, but other things he described that especially made an impact on him that don't come in this paragraph were the Chinese acrobats who entertained him, the musical instruments that he saw in the Forbidden City, death by 1,000 cuts, or so he says. He knew about it. I don't know if he witnessed it. And then he came to ceremonies. And so this is going to bring me to my first question for Liu Chang with just a little bit of buildup. When the Chinese architectural field was first presented to people outside of China, one of the comments that early scholars made, especially in the 1930s, was look how rigid this frame is. The pillars are straight, the beams are straight, 
the struts are straight. Look at the plan. We have almost a complete column grid. In fact, we have a complete column, column grid. If there's a pillar on the outside, there's a row all the way across to the other side. There's a pillar here. There's a row all the way across here. And the same thing in the other direction. Why is it that the city is, I don't like the word rigid so much as straightforward. When I first began to study Chinese architecture, people would say, well, and as it turns out, the buildings of the Forbidden City are less earthquake proof. The buildings built in the Ming and Qing dynasties were less earthquake proof than the great buildings of China's past, 10th century, 11th century, et cetera. But the Forbidden City did seismic testing on Ming Dynasty buildings. Professor Liu Chang, you may have been there. This, I think, was about six years ago. And it is confirmed that the Ming buildings of the Forbidden City were not less earthquake proof. They're extremely earthquake proof. So why is it that the pillars are so straight? And why is there this desire of some to explain this with rigidity? Well, one possible explanation is that really the wood is just simply a frame and the message of the Forbidden City is the decoration, the gold, the silver, the inlay. We might see some repetition of red columns, but there's no place in China, perhaps no place on earth that's decorated as the Forbidden City is. So the question is, could you make some comment or is it valid to argue that everything that we see here really is just the backdrop for ceremony and for the emperor himself? That the architecture as decorative or as elaborate as it is, is intended just to be background. Any comments? on that. And if I may, I would like to make two comments. Uh, number one is the supply, the material supply, the timber supply to build the Forbidden City is so abundant. The craftsmen did not need to pay any attention to lack of material. So uh, this, this is the, uh, the fundamental thing to consider. Uh, secondly, the Forbidden City is not made for the living of the emperor, but for the ceremonies of the emperor. So these structures are not designed to make perfect spaces for people to live in, but rather, just like, as you said, like to build a stage background for all kinds of activities. And this is the reason why in later generations, emperors inclined to build gardens and run out of the forbidden city to enjoy gardens. That's my thinking. Then I, that's, I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. And that leads into the next question, since you mentioned emperors. We've seen several of them already, but just to review, this is Kublai, this is Yongle, uh, who, gets the credit for the 1420 version of the imperial city. If I have to give my list of the most important emperors, my number three is this man, Jia Jing, who rules in the middle of mm -hmm. the 16th century. And he's the man who adds the Southern extension so that the altar of heaven complex and the altar of agriculture complex can be within the Southern city. So he gets credit. These two, I probably could have fit labels on because this is projected so large. This is the famous Kangxi Emperor. I think his name came up 1662 to 1722. And then his grandson, the Qianlong Emperor who rules through the long 18th century, 1736 to 1796. You gave us some other names. You gave us actually a lot of new information um, is this your list or could you bring someone else into this discussion 
who maybe deserves more credit than these men, or maybe one of these men doesn't deserve so much credit. And he comments on the people who really built the Forbidden City. If I may, I would like to take Kangxi's picture out because he <laughs> <laughs> and and add Cixi's picture in. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So we've so we've just heard that. I, I, Aaron, you could probably manipulate this, but let <laughs> us let us keep going because I think we have only five more minutes. So let us keep going. Um, oh, well, so if, do you, if there is one emperor, if you had to choose one emperor, uh, who would be the one who deserves the most credit, even though we're celebrating his, the anniversary of his construction tonight, who would be your number one? Uh, definitely Yong Le, his founder. So uh, I don't think, think anyone else uh, deserves his reputation. Okay, okay. Again, there will be time maybe for some questions later, but let's keep going. Anyone who's been to Beijing and anyone who studies Beijing from the outside joins the Forbidden City with the monument on the right, the Great Wall. And this is not just people who travel to Beijing today. This is historic. Uh, on the left is a page from Ripley's Believe It or Not. That's when it was a book, not just a museum. But Ripley made the famous comment that uh, the Great Wall could be seen from space, or I think he said from the moon. He didn't have any reason to be sure that was true, but in fact, it is true. Satellites have confirmed how far uh, the Great Wall can be seen from, and yes, it can be seen from the moon. What you're looking at on the right is a little bit more interesting. This is a picture from Bannister Fletcher's History of Architecture, a global history. I think it's now in its 21st or 22nd edition. And this picture came out in the fifth edition. In fact, as some of you know the name Liang Sichang, uh, the man who deserves a lot of credit for bringing the Chinese architecture field uh, to the general public. Banister, and, and Liang used Bannister Fletcher's textbook when he studied in the United States. And I've always wondered what he thought about, so there are 16 leaves on the tree. Of course, the tradition grows Greek, Rome, Romanesque, and I, I don't have the whole picture here. But China dangles almost precariously with Peru and Egypt and Assyria. And as if to add insult to injury, China and Japan have to share a leaf, but the building that was chosen is a building from the Forbidden City. So there are two thoughts or two questions here. One is when we look at the Forbidden City, can we really separate it from the Great Wall from, uh, in terms of importance or meaning or somehow can we ever get beyond the Forbidden City or beyond these two monuments in terms of what's important in Chinese architecture? And should we get beyond, go beyond them? Oh, well, uh, if we mention the Great Wall and the Forbidden City, I have a recommendation and we bring in another topic of, of the Grand Canal. Ah, okay. Uh, the Forbidden City, uh, the the greatest person lived in the Forbidden City cares about two things. One is safety, one is uh, communication. And the Great Wall represents the safety and Grand Canal represents communication. And so for him, uh, it's not all about architecture. It's not all about uh, making a place to live or to show off. It's about the, the, the Orthodox, no, uh, about the um, the the uh, authority of you know, reigning is about the power. So um, uh, the tree of architecture itself, uh, the Fletcher's tree, um, it means not that much to the emperor. <laughs> okay. No, 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 not to general Chinese people. <laughs> I wanted to show the tree again. 
Okay, so let me keep going. You met, you you brought into your talk what was happening in Europe or outside of China at key moments in the history of the Forbidden City. But uh, globalization, global architecture is extremely important to all of us today and many teach courses on global architecture. So what I did here is I took uh, five other palaces that existed at the time of the Forbidden City during at least some point in its history. None of them, in fact, was as long lived as the Forbidden City, but maybe there are a few other comments to make. Uh, the top, this is Buckingham Palace, begun 1703, completed 1705. Versailles, begun 1682, opens as a museum to the public, 1837. The Tsar's Winter Palace, uh, used as the palace 1732 to 1917, now public space, Hermitage Museum. Japan, the Emperor's Palace in uh, Kyoto, beginning at the period of Meiji Restoration, beginning in 1868, the Emperor moves to the city that's today Tokyo. And since 1877, the palace stands as a monument. Now it's an open tourist monument. And Korea, which has the most visual similarities to the Forbidden City, has five palaces that the rulers used during the Joseon Dynasty, which is roughly contemporary to the Forbidden City, 13, uh, Forbidden City from Yongle on, 1392 to 1897. And of course, I've put East Asia on the right, I've put Europe on the left. Every great palace, uh, with a few exceptions, seems to go the way of a public monument. Are these valid comparisons? Is, the, is this a valid comparison? Any thoughts, comments, anything that you would like to mention about this um, or maybe about what it's like to have a monument built of permanent materials compared to what we have at the center and on the right? Uh. Well, it's very meaningful juxtaposition of all these important uh, heritage sites uh, on this screen. And I'm fascinated by this idea. And uh, for eternity uh, uh, angle of thinking, yeah. uh, I, I, do I do feel that the Forbidden City was actually uh, think about um, the eternity in another sense, like it's not a material that will last longer, but the, so, as you said, the rigid plan of the city uh, following the, uh, the ideal of uh, cosmology uh, of the, uh, the, the, the constellations, and that keeps this uh, city uh, so-called eternal. And so the final question that I was going to ask you, you've actually, answered, but maybe there will be one additional answer. Every, every once in a while, I will get a request to give a lecture, not on the Forbidden City, but more than once, someone has said to me, could I give a lecture on the secrets of the Forbidden City? And so I will say, <laughs> what do you mean? And they'll say, there has to be something beyond what we read in the books and beyond what we all know. And can't you tell us what it is? So when I have to give that kind of lecture, one of the things I talk about is something that you told us in more detail. I talk about the use of the module. People seem to know that Chinese buildings are built modularly and you showed us this with the Hall of the Supreme Harmony. But here I'm showing you this approximate five by nine proportion that spreads through the whole Forbidden City and you can see how it works in uh, smaller parts of the Forbidden City, and you can see this is the Hall of Supreme Harmony, the true center of the center, I guess the most powerful space in all of uh, pre-modern China. Are there more secrets, or is there something going on now, excavation, renovation, something that you are finding 
that maybe we can expect to read about, hear about, or even see the next time people listening in visit the Forbidden City? Uh, well, we're working on that direction. We're following two threads. One thread is like what we call the Queen Ant thread. It is thinking the idea of the emperor is the uh, uh, interpretation of the rights of the ratio, uh, ratio uh, uh, arrangement, like nine, five ratio things. And another thread is like a worker ant uh, thread, is what are the secrets of the craftsman? Uh, is there any proportions they, they, they incline to stick to? Uh, is there any uh, hidden numbers they feel are most important? So based on the two threads, I think in the near future, I might be able to uh, give some more stories. So, <laughs> I hope so. So if, if that, that's the case, then we thank you very much. The Forbidden City, I'm a little bit to the south on the left. This is the Ancestral Temple. But the Forbidden City, I think, is unique even compared to the buildings that I had on the screen a few minutes ago and that it has so gracefully and in such an extraordinary way passed through 600 years of history. And so maybe this is the moment where we stop. And uh, I will say, I look forward to seeing you again soon in uh, Beijing, in person. New York, <laughs> yeah. or Philadelphia. And I guess we all look forward to many more birthdays uh, of the Forbidden City. And now I turn the, uh, program back to Denda Elliott. Exactly. Don't go away. Don't go away. Please stay where you are. This is so fascinating. And um, we're going to we're, we're going to go a little bit longer. I hope the audience will forgive us, but this is just so fascinating. So I think we'll go to 815. And we have is some my, questions. Is my video off? Are you still, is, can you still see the picture or is, is did Aaron... No, it's just, it's just okay, you. Sorry. Okay. We're, we're good. We're good. Okay, we're good. Thank Thanks. you. Um, so I I'm by the way, I can't be seen. I just wanted to say how much fun I've had listening. <laughs> but my, I don't know if you can see me, but it's been so much fun. Wonderful. Um, so our first question is from Didi Pei, who happens to be the co-chair of our board <laughs> and an architect, a very well-known architect himself. And so Didi wants to know, he says, I have had the privilege of working in two royal palaces, the Louvre in Paris and the Forbidden City in Beijing. In Beijing, we worked on the Jianfu Palace. The Louvre uh -huh. was a contemporary construction in a classical context. Jianfu was a renovation of a reconstruction to incorporate modern conveniences, such as electricity and lighting and air conditioning. Do you think it's possible to build a contemporary architecture on the grounds of the Forbidden City? And if so, where? Off to you, Nancy. Oh. <laughs> no, I think that's your question. I think that's a wonderful question. Can, so where, that's where, the question is really, can the Forbidden City move into the 21st century and still be the Forbidden City? I guess. Could there be, could there be some contemporary architecture someplace in the Forbidden City? <sighs> what, what, what do we call uh, by the name of architecture? Uh, can we call the, the facilities that help to conserve the interior uh, environment of the uh, old buildings, uh, be modern architecture or not. I if so, I think we have modest uh, possibility to intervene the present uh, uh, condition of the city and improve uh, and find a better way to preserve not only the structure themselves, but also the interiors and the remainings of, and the collections of it. So here's another very interesting question from Leanne Ruff, <clears throat> who says, so you were talking about the fact that there was no shortage of timber for the construction, but that seems to contradict assessments of widespread deforestation in Northern China by the 15th century. So apparently the forests were in trouble back then. So the question is, what, what was the source of the timber? Where was the timber coming from that was being used for construction? And were different materials sourced from different places? Oh, that's uh, terribly true, uh, yes. This construction almost consumed a, a, a great many forests in the south, in Sichuan province, in Jiangxi province, and Shanxi. And we have a bunch of uh, articles writing on this topic. 
And following those threads, uh, we can definitely tell that uh, in that uh, 15th century, a, a, a large percentage of Nan Moor, the Phoebe wood, uh, we will have a lot of name for that. Nan Moor is almost disappeared, leaving only young uh, twigs there, nothing big left. Where did the Nan Moor come from? Did it come from the south? South, Sichuan and Jiangxi and province like that. I see. Okay, so there's another question from Marina Forbes, who is asking if you could possibly comment on the significance of colors in Chinese culture and architecture. So Me or Nancy's question? I think you go ahead. I think I think you're the one. You're the one we want to hear. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, superficially, uh, the colors uh, schemes changed in history. They have different color palettes in different uh, era. Uh, and the color is, if we say blue, the blue change along the history uh, 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 from uh, uh, the, the, the azurite, and the lapis lazuli, all the way down to uh, man-made ultramarine and, and Prussian blue even, a lot of different hues of the color. But the, the key idea of making the uh, color scheme, the decorative wood structure uh, formed uh, in Ming Dynasty, we believe, is following a special uh, style pattern. But to emphasize the 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 shade and shadow, shad shadow, how to pronounce that, mm -hmm. under the eave, to make that shadow area uh, dark and meaningful. And in the meantime, they use reddish columns uh, to give a shining effect uh, because they are just standing against the sunlight. So this kind of a feeling is very subtle and unusual, uh, but that scheme uh, does not only meet the earlier uh, ideas like a uh, uh, black color favored by certain uh, dynasty and uh, purple color favored, favored by Tang dynasty, those kind of things is quite uh, invented, influenced by the invasion of, uh, of Mongols. So, so Mongol preferred white, and they also bring us a lot of uh, interesting color schemes uh, to the mainland, mainland land and the Forbidden City. Mm -hmm. So basically that. Yeah, Nancy, did you wanna add anything to no, that? that was a perfect answer. No. Okay, great. Um, so I think we have time for a couple more quick questions. Um, Ato Seme is saying, thank you for the great presentation. Is there any Isla Islamic influence, especially the early Islam in the Middle East on Chinese architecture or vice versa? Um, since the trade routes were well established by then, is there, do you see any Islamic influence? No, I'll, I will answer. I can answer that one or I can start the answer. Really? No, um, even in the Mongol period very, very little. This is something that people look for. It seems that so many people have come in and out of China and have stood inside China's cities and inside China's buildings. But in fact, one of the beauties of this timber frame system is that it's so adaptable to so many purposes. So that rather than China changing or Chinese architecture changing, what happens is that necessity of a Buddhist temple, a Taoist temple, Confucian hall, palace, elements of a tomb underground, or even a mosque, if that's the question you're asking, can have space that's produced so that worship or the necessities of prayer can take place within the timber frame. The outside, the ground plan, the pillars, can stay the same, an altar can be replaced by a throne, a throne can be replaced by an altar. So Great. actually almost none. I'd love to ask one final question to both of you, which is um, what's the relevance of this traditional ancient architecture of the Forbidden City to today? In other words, young architects today, are they still studying it? They're building skyscrapers, why is it important? Is it still important today? 
You want to uh, go? We probably both have an answer. Uh, go, go ahead. <laughs> Allow me to speak first. Yeah. Um, uh, to me, um, the young architect at least should have a book of uh, the, the, the historical uh, solutions to different kinds of architectural uh, challenges instead of following the uh, authentically uh, the, the traditional uh, stock, uh, building method. Uh, so uh, I think it's available for us architectural historians to do is to, uh, to find more stories, give them more uh, possible tools and uh, I will not say guidelines, guidelines, but rather references for them to think about not at all will be the uh, uh, historical style will be the leading style in Beijing, nor in other places in China. It's a globalized uh, world already, uh, but the knowledge of the past will still remain uh, valuable in the future, in the long run. No, and, and I agree, and I'll just throw out a few more um, points. The Chinese architectural historians take the Opium Wars, they take approximately the year 1850, 1849-ish as the turning point, as the moment when modernization had to happen, but it didn't happen overnight, not to the Forbidden City and not to most other places in China. Uh, the real turning point come, begins in the second half of the 20th century. And by the time the 1980s hit, my personal feeling is that we really are dealing with global architecture. And although someone could put on what's nicknamed a big roof or someone could put simulation of a bracket set onto a building. Mm -hmm. In fact, architecture right now is global. Um, I think the, the question that was, that was asked, your first question is a really hard question and I'm not sure if I could have answered it. I think any architect who's trained in China has very similar training to someone who's trained in the United States or in Paris or in Tokyo, with the exception of people in China, architecture students in China draw better. Uh, P, uh, architectural <laughs> students in China have to, have to learn draftsmanship. And uh, we are losing this. Uh, year by year and generation by generation in the United States, it's much faster to do it on the computer. That's why somebody like me can, can do something even if I can't draw. But, but um, it's very hard. I think it would be frustrating for a contemporary architect in China to try to go back to a traditional method. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Thank you so much. I, I mean, and here's to drawing and draftsmanship, right? Um, <laughs> yes. Basically, time up, but I just hope you all agree that this evening's program is truly one for the history books. Um, I want to thank Director Ren, Professor Liu. Thank you so much for getting up so early in Beijing and joining us. Um, Professor Steinhardt, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom. And thank you to AIA for your partnership in this program. Um, finally, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, as a special thank you, we would like to offer everyone joining us tonight a special 20% discount on China Institute membership. So your membership brings you discounts on everything uh, from classes to programs and access to special programs, but really much more importantly, your membership allows us to bring special world-class programs like this evening's uh, presentations. Um, and we believe that this kind of cross-cultural exchange is truly more important than ever. So please uh, email membership at chinainstitute.org and use the code word forbidden. The code <laughs> word is forbidden. And with the code word forbidden, you will get a 20% discount. So I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Professors Liu and Steinhardt, thank you so much. Hola. We're honored to have you. The next program in this series uh, will look at the private life of the emperor on December 2nd. So please don't forget to sign up for that. And finally, I want to toast the Forbidden City at 600. So happy birthday to the Forbidden City. Thank you so much for joining. Good night.